Hello, and welcome to the Dark Ages podcast. This is episode four, The Sack of Rome. Last time we left the Western Empire in chaos, as the Rhine defenses crumbled under the onslaught of West German tribes that were pouring across the border. Our hero, Alaric, the king of the Visigoths, played by Jason Statham, had thousands of men at his disposal who he would send straight to Gaul to help shore up the frontier. <laughs> I'm kidding. Of course that's not what he was going to do. He and his thousands of men were set in Noricum, ready to descend on Italy to force the emperor to the bargaining table and make the little twerp see reason. Except, as we know, Alaric would not really be dealing with the little twerp. We haven't talked much about Emperor Honorius, and that's because he hasn't done much worth talking about. In 408, which is where we are, he was 24, and just as perceptive and decisive as he had been when he had taken the throne, which is to say he was still basically a 10-year-old. We need to cast him for our movie. Um, Jason Sudeikis is a little too old. Uh, Topher Grace could do it. Anyway... That the empire functioned at all was entirely due to a kind of bureaucratic inertia and to the efforts of the Generalissimo of the West, by name of Stilicho. Stilicho, played by James Purefoy, you'll remember, was as competent as Honorius was gormless, though also arrogant and ruthless. He was also a German, which I don't think I've mentioned before, but yeah, half vandal, which is something his enemies absolutely held against him. Anyway, as we saw last time, he and Alaric had been circling each other in a heavily armed pas de deux for the better part of two decades now. I like to think that each of them bore the other a kind of soldierly respect, though I have, of course, no way to be sure. They had, in a development I don't think I mentioned last time, reached a wary alliance, and were readying an attempt to assert Western control over Illyricum when everything was loaded into the proverbial handbasket. The disaster on the Rhine was indirectly partly Alaric's fault. In order to defend Italy from the succession of attacks, of which Alex was just one, Stilicho had stripped the Rhine garrisons down to skeleton crews, and was depending on, um, I don't know, habit, to keep the Germans in line. And guess what? That didn't work. Pressed from behind by the Huns, the Germans shot past the Rhine forts like Play-Doh through a pasta maker. With no effective response from Italy, the commander in Britannia, by name of Constantine, took things in hand and sailed down to Gaul to declare himself emperor and get some law and order going, abandoning Britannia in the process. On top of everything else, the eastern emperor, Arcadius, then inconsiderately chose that moment to die. See, this right here is why I was trying to stick to the one tribe at a time approach. There's just too much going on, and we will come back to all of that in its own time. But for now, back to Italy. Alaric demanded lands in Noricum and two other provinces, and the cash payment that he had been promised by Stilicho in their dickering over the aborted Illyricum campaign. The Roman Senate, which believe it or not, is still kind of a thing, was not enthusiastic about the idea of paying Alaric off again, until Stilicho talked them into it. That talking into it, on top of all the other chaos, finally gave Stilicho's rivals at court the opening they'd been looking for for years. The thing about a puppet emperor is you have to keep a pretty tight grip on his strings, or other people are going to want to play with him. Stilicho was distracted, what with the empire disintegrating around him and all, and had to let his grip loosen. A courtier named Olympias began muttering in Honorius's ear, suggesting that Stilicho was planning to put his own son on the eastern throne, which he might have been. And once that happened, what would stop Stilicho from getting rid of Honorius? And Olympias didn't stop at whispering to the emperor. He let the rumor spread far and wide, and it had the desired effect. A revolt started against Stilicho's command, with legionaries killing at least seven officers in the process. Stilicho knew the jig was up, and returned to Ravenna, where he was arrested and then executed on August 22nd, 408, just nine days after the outbreak of the revolt. Olympias's coup was a complete success, but he wasn't finished yet. Stilicho's willingness to deal with the Germans, like Alaric, was a major part of his enemy's objections, and now they plan to deal with the German problem. In the turmoil that immediately followed the general's fall, local German populations in Italy were massacred by their neighbors. And when I say local German populations, what I mean 
is the wives and children of the Germanic Federati troops that were serving in the Roman army. Whether this was planned or an unintended upwelling of anti-German feeling, I'm not at all sure, but it doesn't really matter. The effect was the same either way. All of those German federates picked up their swords and shields and marched up to join Alaric. The anti-Stilico faction had cut off its collective nose despite its collective face. It had thrown the collective baby out with the collective bathwater and other collective cliches. Almost immediately, the new imperial power brokers discovered for themselves just how many chainsaws the general had been juggling. Remember, kids, before overthrowing a rival, always make sure you actually want his job. Also, don't murder thousands of your soldiers' wives and children and expect their loyalty. Helpful tips from the Dark Ages podcast. Olympias, though, like most men who do this kind of thing, was completely confident in his ability to handle the situation. When envoys arrived from Alaric offering to overlook the coup, if the court would grant subsidies and hostages and permission to settle in Pannonia, Olympias rejected that proposal. The core of his faction's motivation was anti-German prejudice. He was not about to start his new regime by making deals with Germans. And so Alaric readied for war, with his new army champing at the bit, eager for revenge. Six weeks after Stilicho's execution, Alaric invaded Italy again. He sacked Rimini and moved through the countryside as if he was going to a festival, according to the historian Zosimus. He clearly felt he had nothing to fear from Stilicho's successors, and nor did he. He reached Rome and laid siege to it late in the year 408. The psychological and spiritual importance of the city of Rome can't be overstated. It had been the center of all circles in the Western world for many lifetimes. The shine had gone off of it a bit in recent centuries. Military administration had moved to more convenient centers in Constantinople, Milan, Sirmium, and Trier. And the emperor himself had removed to the easily defendable city of Ravenna on the coast. Remember, that was due to Alaric's raiding in 405. But in the minds of the empire's citizens, all roads continued to lead to Rome. There isn't really a good analogy in the modern world that I can think of. The nearest I can come up with is New York City as a cultural and financial hub in the U.S., but it doesn't occupy the same place in the minds of Americans as Rome did. Rome was the heart of the Roman Empire, it's right there in the name, and it had been effectively sacrosanct, at least from foreign armies, for more than 700 years. It was also more and more becoming the empire's spiritual center as the Bishop of Rome's influence gradually expanded and the emperors fell. Alaric's siege triggered a little crisis of faith within Rome. Christianity had been the favored faith of the empire for more than a generation, but there were still plenty of old-school pagans in high places. Rome itself, in spite of its bishop, was a stronghold of those holdouts, especially in the conservative senate. Sacrifices and traditional divination were banned, but the old temples remained open, and many still worshipped the old gods there, though perhaps less exuberantly than they once had. When a hostile force camped outside the walls, pagan senators wondered aloud why the Christian's god would allow his people to be so consistently defeated by this barbarian nobody, ignoring the fact that Alaric was himself an Arian Christian. The senators called for a resumption of sacrifices to Jupiter, in hopes of winning back his favor. The calls became so strident that the bishop, that would be Pope Innocent I in this case, conceded that sacrifices could take place, but only in private. That wasn't good enough for the pagans, but the bishop wouldn't budge and the movement fizzled. Surely the emperor would come to their aid soon, right? But Honorius and Olympias appeared to be sitting on their hands. Honorius felt he lacked enough troops that were prepared to face the Visigothic menace, which is probably true given that most of his Gothic contingents had mutinied after their families were murdered. Cerus, remember him, had been Stilicho's man, and while he remained nominally loyal to Honorius, he made himself scarce, so there would be no help coming from there. In Rome, in the absence of leadership from Ravenna, the emperor's sister Placidia was the most powerful person in the city. Placidia was as impressive as her brother wasn't, and will be with us for a while going forward, so we need to cast her in our movie. I'm going with Marion Cotillard. I don't think the accent will be a problem. It was becoming clear that no help would be forthcoming. As December arrived, Alaric took control of the Tiber, cutting off the city from resupply, and starvation began to set in. There was nothing for it, and the Senate sent an embassy to Alaric. 
Alaric named his price, which was all the movable goods and provisions left in the city. The shock senators asked, What will you leave for the people? Their lives, was Alaric's terse answer. They tried talking tough, pointing out that every Roman citizen had been trained to fight in defense of the city, and even if the Visigoths managed to break in, they would be vastly outnumbered by the armed residents. It's hard to imagine Alaric receiving this threat with a straight face. Thicker grass, he replied, is easier to cut. But, you know, imagine Jason Statham saying it. Isn't that awesome? There aren't many direct quotes attributed to Alaric, but the ones that there are have a pithy, no-nonsense quality that really stands out against the style of late antiquity, which is fairly overwrought. I know that the odds are good that this is just chroniclers making things up, and that there's no way to know the actual conversations that took place, but why be a fun ruiner about it? I choose to believe that that is exactly what Alaric said. The Romans agreed to ransom the city. The final price agreed upon was 5,000 pounds of gold and 30,000 pounds of silver, along with an array of hides and silk and 3,000 pounds of pepper. Gesundheit. The value of the metal coin alone would have be about $105 million today, if my very unscientific scribbling is correct. That's just the value of the metal. To gather all the required specie, pagan temples were stripped of their ornamentation, and some of their precious idols melted down. It's hard not to see that as a little bit of petty revenge on the part of the Christian leaders for the suggestion that this was all a punishment. Alaric withdrew, loaded down with treasure, but none of the issues that had led to the invasion had disappeared. His army had swollen to nearly 40,000 men now, as escaped slaves from the city joined him. He withdrew only as far as Tuscany to spend the winter and see how things stood when the emperor and his lackeys had had time to think things over. The emperor and his lackeys did indeed think things over, but they only dug in their heels. An embassy from the Senate to Ravenna imploring the emperor to give hostages to the Visigoths and Alaric the title he wanted was ignored. Instead, five legions were brought over from Dalmatia, possibly six, to garrison Rome and prevent the humiliation of December from being repeated. That was a fine idea, but Honorius, or really Olympius, put an absolute schmuck in command of this force of 6,000 men. The commander's name was Valens, which is a little annoying, or possibly just prophetic, and when he got the assignment to go and reinforce the capital, he chose to take the most direct route possible, even though that route led right through the territory where the Visigoths were camping. Marching to avoid Alaric, he said, would be cowardly. So the 6,000 men, who probably would have been quite useful when stationed on high walls and operating war machines, marched themselves straight at the 40,000 Visigoths. You know how they say discretion is the better part of valor? Valens didn't. The legions were intercepted, and predictably only about a hundred avoided death or capture. Those hundred men dutifully reported to Rome, where I am sure their presence was appreciated. Less appreciated was news that a new player had entered the game. Alaric's brother-in-law, Atolf, had appeared out of the Julian Alps in the northeast and was marching down the peninsula to join Alaric. Panicked, Honorius gave Olympias a contingent of men and sent him to intercept this new threat. What exactly happened is a bit confusing, because Olympias supposedly met Atolf in battle near Pisa, killed a thousand Goths, only lost seventeen of his own men, but was forced to retreat back to Ravenna. What's that about? Explain that to me. Not even Honorius was dull enough to see that as anything but a debacle, and Olympias fell from power and had to scoot himself across the Adriatic to save his skin. The new big man was named Jovius, and he had been an ally of Stilicho, and so was prepared to talk with Alaric. He met with Alaric, who wanted pretty much what he had always wanted, land in three provinces in the north, a yearly tribute of gold and grain. Jovius forwarded that request to the emperor, adding that if they also offered Alaric a command in the army, it might be possible to knock a couple denarii off the rest of the price. Honorius, being a clod, refused point-blank that idea of offering Alaric a place in the army, and did so in strongly insulting terms. That letter was then read out aloud in the next meeting between Jovius and Alaric, and that was the end of that meeting. Alaric was now fully prepared for war, until he heard that Honorius was recruiting 10,000 Huns to come and get rid of this German pest, 
at which point he dropped his demands for title and most of the land, asking only for lands in Noricum and as much grain as the emperor felt like giving him. The threat of the Huns to the Goths was still very real. Honorius rejected this offer too, and Alaric marched back to Rome to start a second siege, hoping, I would think, to get inside before those Huns arrived. Those Huns never did arrive, by the way. The deal was apparently a busted flush, or possibly a bluff. Alaric was losing patience with the young emperor, so he had a new idea. If this emperor wouldn't see reason, why not make a new one that would? The Senate had sent emissaries out almost as soon as Alaric had reappeared, and they were now only too happy to help in his plan. Oh, yes, of course, you need a new puppet emperor. Well, why not take old Priscus Attalus here? He's a solid chap, good family, you know. Um, oh, yes, I'm sure he wouldn't object to being baptized. Whatever you need, Alaric, dear. Um, just don't forget to call off the siege, all right? Capital fellow. Alaric and Atolf were appointed to the offices they had been seeking by Priscus Attalus, and the two set up a rival government. Commande the three set up a rival government commandeering provisions from around Italy and sending out letters informing the provinces of the change in management. Not everyone fell in line. Gaul and Britannia were effectively lost to any control from Italy anyway, and the governor of Africa sent back word that he remained loyal to Honorius and that Priscus Attalus and his Gothic managers could mump it. This was a problem, since Africa is where all the food was. Attalus and Alaric agreed that they should send some large men with points to bring the governor into line, but Attalus would not allow any Visigoths to go on the expedition. He was afraid they might try to take over Africa, which would be a disaster. I mean, imagine Germans in control of Africa. I am being ironic for effect here in a foreshadowy kind of way. So, an entirely Roman force was sent. Well, said Alaric, what if we all go and at least make sure the northern Italian cities know who is boss? Oh, fine, said Attalus, and off they all went. Jovian, who was also out of patience with Honorius, defected to this new emperor. Honorius was a mess at this point, and probably whimpering quietly somewhere in a corner. He sent a desperate message to Attalus, offering to share the Western Empire with him, which is fairly pathetic. Attalus replied that he would only negotiate about where Honorius would spend his exile which is rude. Honorius was just on the point of cheesing it out of Italy entirely when 4,000 troops arrived in Ravenna from the east to help defend the city. Whew! Meanwhile, that army that had been sent to Africa was defeated, and so grain shipments were cut off. Problem. So Alaric and Attalus tried again, and again Attalus refused to allow any Visigoths to participate. Priscus Attalus was proving himself to be more trouble than he was worth. Alaric made the decision to depose him, if that's even the right word. He stripped him of the imperial regalia, but didn't kill him, and Attalus, having nowhere else to go, would tag along with the Visigoths for quite a while after this little brush with quasi-imperium. Alaric turned himself around and marched off toward Ravenna to see if making contact with Honorius directly might break the deadlock. As he approached the capital, he found that the young emperor was willing to talk. The last year or so had just been awful for the poor kid and they opened negotiations, even meeting in person. Things seemed to be going well, when another actor reappeared and ruined everything. We've met him in passing a couple of times already. This is Cerus, and he was that Visigoth of the Amal dynasty that had been one of the chiefs that had defected from Alaric back when Stilicho had him on the ropes after the Battle of Verona. Cerus had become a commander in the regular Roman army and had close ties to Stilicho. He may have had a personal grudge against Alaric, maybe having been a rival for power in earlier days. Some sources suggest a blood feud between the two families. Whatever the reason, Cerus marched down from his position in the north to attack Alaric's camp outside of Ravenna. The attack seems to have done not much physical damage to Alaric's forces, but had major and long-lasting consequences for his position. Alaric could not believe that Honorius wasn't involved in orchestrating Cerus's attack. He decided that Honorius had acted in bad faith and he could no longer be negotiated with. That was it. He was done. No more Mr. Nice Guy. Alaric returned to Rome and redoubled his efforts. The third siege was no longer about applying pressure. A much harder point was now being made. On August 24th, 410, the Visigoths entered the city. There are a few versions of how that actually happened. 
Some say that the walls were actually breached. Others that a small contingent were able to infiltrate the city and open the gates. Or that the gates were opened by some disaffected slave or some other kind of treachery. All of these seem equally plausible, though the treacherous slave might just be an attempt to save some face in the humiliation that the sack represented. And it was a humiliation. A humiliation and a trauma. Historians never tire of noting the comparative mildness of the Visigoth sack of Rome, especially when set next to the horrors the Romans themselves often visited on cities they had defeated. This starts early with Jordanes, who was of Gothic ancestry himself, and who noted that when they entered the city, by Alaric's command they merely sacked it rather than setting it on fire as wild peoples usually do. Alaric, being a Christian himself, designated the basilicas of St. Peter and St. Paul as safe zones of refuge, and posted guards around them to make sure that any who fled there would be undisturbed. Burning was indeed kept to a minimum. Archaeology shows that destruction by fire was mostly limited to a few buildings around the Forum. But a sacking is still a sacking. When we're arguing that a sack is less than a sack, because fewer homes are destroyed than usual, then we are falling into the trap of forgetting lived experience. Though the basic infrastructure of Rome weathered the storm mostly untouched, all of the atrocities that went along with pillage were present. Everything conceivable was carried off, including people, to be sold into slavery, and the survivors left destitute. There was no general slaughter, which might have been expected for a city that fell after a period of resistance, but the inhabitants didn't know that would be the case when it started. And though the majority of the city may have escaped death, many were tortured to reveal the locations of their wealth. We may note that it could have been worse, but the three days the Visigoths spent in Rome were an eternity to those that lived through it, especially the women. Writing a few years after witnessing the sack personally, the British monk Plagius described it like this, quote, Every house was a scene of misery, and equally filled with grief and affliction. The slave and the man of quality were in the same circumstances, and everywhere the terror of death and slaughter were the same. Thousands of homeless refugees spread out across the empire, carrying news of the disaster far and wide. Some found new homes. Others were robbed of what little they had left and a non-trivial number found themselves sold into slavery by the very people they had gone to, to for help. Nobody missed the reversal of fortune that this represented. St. Jerome put it like this, Who would believe that Rome, built up by the conquest of the whole world, had collapsed, that the mother of nations would also become their tomb? End quote. The sack renewed the debate between pagan and Christians within the empire. Pagans blamed the catastrophe on the abandonment of the old gods and called for a renewal of Roman tradition. St. Augustine of Hippo set out to counter that position, saying the material city was meaningless in comparison to the spiritual city prepared by God for the faithful. The resulting book, The City of God, laid the groundwork for the medieval Catholic Church and remains a torment for freshman humanities students to this very day. Among the captives removed from Rome was Galla Placidia, the emperor's sister, and probably the greatest treasure the Visigoths could possibly have gotten their hands on. Placidia, Mary and Cotillard, was one of a handful of powerful and interesting women produced by the Theodosian dynasty, almost as if in compensation for the line's universally useless men. We'll talk much more about her in the next episode. Speaking of universally useless men, there is a story, probably not true, about Honorius's response to the city's fall. It appears in one of Procopius's histories, and it's fairly short, so I'll just quote it in full. Quote, And at that time they say that the Emperor Honorius in Ravenna received the message from one of the eunuchs, evidently a keeper of the poultry, that Rome had perished. And the Emperor cried out and said, And yet he has just eaten from my hands! For he had a very large rooster, Rome by name. And the eunuch comprehending his words said that it was the city of Rome which had perished at the hands of Alaric. And the emperor, with a sigh of relief, answered quickly, Ah, oh, but I thought that my foul Rome had perished. So great, they say, was the folly with which this emperor was possessed. End quote. Twerp. Like I said, it's probably not true. But where would be the fun in leaving it out? I have to wonder how Alaric felt as he watched his men storming through the ancient city. No source that I could find even speculates. But in spite of the shock that the sack delivered to the rest of the world, 
Despite the wealth that his men were now busily loading onto wagons and carrying off through the streets, the sack of Rome represented a failure for Alaric, and I can't imagine that he wasn't smart enough to know that. That comment about leaving the Romans with their lives back at the first siege brings to me as a man playing a role, presenting the barbarian bellicosity that could get him what he wanted. He had invaded Italy. He had roamed seemingly at will through the heart of what was still the greatest power in the world, and it had ultimately won him nothing. Pillage was the only tool he had left to provide for his people and to ensure their loyalty. They were still, after all of this, without a home, without a place in the Empire. He would have to do better. At no point did Alaric or any of the men surrounding him ever think that they were going to overthrow the Roman Empire or set up an independent kingdom. In spite of the evidence in front of them, to Alaric and everyone else, the empire was a fact of life. For 500 years, it had been at the center of the world. Changing that was inconceivable. And yet, it wasn't so far off now. So Alaric turned south, intending to try to, to cross to Sicily, or maybe Africa. Maybe without the obstructionist to tell us, he could make some headway. Maybe there in the breadbasket of the empire he could carve out a place for his people, and maybe even keep himself at their head. But Alaric never got there. His attempts to cross the tricky Straits of Messina to Sicily failed. The Goths weren't really very good at boats. And he moved northward again. He fell ill with some kind of fever, and died while laying siege to Cosenza, way down toward the toe of Italy. Legend says, famously, that he was buried in the bed of the river Busento, with everyone involved in the burial then executed to keep the location secret. Whether that's true or not, and it's a bit that shows up in other stories about Attila and Genghis Khan, it's an appropriate story for Alaric. Alaric was around 40 or 45 years old, and had been king of the Visigoths for 15 years. While he had never secured the homeland or title he had aimed at, he had kept his people together, and ensure that they would remain a force to be reckoned with inside the empire. It would fall to his successors to carve out the permanent place he had fought for, and they would in time be more successful than he could imagine. Next week we will follow the Goths and their new leaders as they finally do find a place for themselves inside the Roman Empire, just in time for the whole thing to come crashing down. Thank you all for listening. There have been quite a few new downloads since last week, which is very exciting to see. If you want to take the time to rate and review the show wherever you listen to it, that would be much appreciated. Thanks very much to those who already have. As always, check out the website, darkagespodcast.podbean.com. Not a lot of new material on there for this episode, but that's where you will find supporting material, including my sources. Also, on Twitter, at Dark Ages Pod, and I've now set up a Facebook group to add to my list of social media that I don't really understand. Thank you all for listening, and if you're enjoying it, tell your friends. Until next time, then, take care. Mm-hmm.